All right, everybody, back for another episode today of Brushing and Bait with Kobe White. Uh, the hurricane pushed Kobe back to Mississippi, so he's going to be here for a while. That's a good thing for us. And uh, today we have the good fortune of having a former major league second baseman, Mr. Jeff Fry, who spent quite a few years in the league. So we need to bring in an expert on the topic we're talking about today. Um, Kobe, I don't know if you know this or not. This guy might be a little too old for you to know who he is, but this guy was uh, one of the better. I won't, I, he's top 15% middle infielders probably of my lifetime for sure. And, uh, and like I said, you know, he uh, he played for quite a while. So when we get to talking about the subject we're talking about today, uh, you're going to find out his expertise is going to lend well to the discussion. Uh, Jeff, can't, can't thank you enough for being on today, brother. We appreciate it. Thank you, William, and uh, appreciate it, Colby. All right, now, Jeff, here's the problem. We, uh, we run across some videos on the Internet about experts trying to show young men and young women how to be the very best baseball player they can be. Um, they are trying to convince these young people through ridiculous tactics that it will make you a better hitter, better fielder, whatever, uh, by going through these exercises. Now, I know you're a huge supporter of big bucks for better batting averages. That's correct, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're a huge fan of that. Yeah. Now, I've seen a few videos you've put on that, uh, well, let's just be honest. You've torn down a few of these uh, these beliefs. Uh, you have some of the better, uh, I hate to call them mockumentaries, but they are. I mean, you're, you're, you're not mocking the young people. Let's get that clear. That's Nothing you put on the Internet has is being negative toward the kids, right? No, sir. No, sir. I mean, it's, it's complete opposite of that. I'm trying to educate the parents first and foremost that, uh, that a lot of this teaching that they're they're paying for a lot of money for is not helping their kids development and um, these videos that I post are all I was thinking about this a minute ago at, at first when I first started doing this I'd go kind of sometimes look for look for some of this content and stuff I don't do that anymore every single thing I post is sent to me by people and you know it's just they know it's ridiculous and I think it's it's almost gotten to the point where if somebody sees something silly they're like I wonder what wonder what Jeff Fry would think about this and they send it to me and that was never the intent of this but these videos that I post have all been posted before so when people get upset that I repost it and say that I'm mocking the kids it's it's completely ridiculous I would never do that so for the the novice that's got a kid they they want them to be the best athlete you know they can be through whatever means necessary when you jump on the internet and you try to disprove some of this ridiculousness this absolute absurd so some of these videos are absolutely absurd some of the techniques but and they say well who is this jeff fry guy well tell everybody exactly who jeff fry is i mean it, it's not like you're just some scrub that played little league and then you know our american legion ball and now you're out here trying to tell everybody what an expert you are in the field. Give a little of your back history. Well, I mean, that's the funny part of it is, um, I guess because of social media now that you can, um, guys who never even made their high school teams are talking trash to former major leaguers, and it's pretty funny. It's, you know, they call you know they call me Judy. I'm a Judy hitter because yes. I didn't hit home runs at 5'9", 160 pounds when I played. You know, I, I mean, I was, I was taught to – hit the ball on the ground, hit the ball on the line, and not hit home runs because I couldn't hit home runs. And uh, But anyway, I you know I played – I was fortunate enough to play for 15 years professionally, just over nine years in the major leagues. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for a few injuries, I would have had, I think, at least 10 years. Uh, I had, I think, eight surgeries while I was in, in, playing in the major leagues and five knee surgeries and – you know that kind of it's kind of tough to overcome that stuff. But 15 years professional, I hit 290 in the big leagues. Um, you know, I was a solid defensive player, good base runner, just kind of all round guy. That uh, you know, at the end of my career, I turned into a utility guy and um, played every position in the major leagues except pitcher and catcher. And probably could have done that if you had to. Hey, in in today's MLB, 
in some of these games they got going on, you probably would have had a chance to pitch. I used to ask Jimmy Williams all the time if I could be the – if we had a blowout, if he'd let me pitch. And he – in Jimmy Williams' fashion, he would cross his arms and he'd go, Frito, if I let you pitch and you get hurt, I'm going to get fired. So you're not pitching. <laughs> but I, I was the uh, emergency catcher. Never had to go in. I probably would have been terrified trying to catch in the major leagues. But, uh, I mean, I would have strapped it on and done it. My team needed me. Well, what's funny to me about that whole, like, I guess from a pitcher's point of view, you know, they'll tell us, we can't have you hit. We're scared you're going to get hurt. And that makes sense to me because the way the torquing is, chance of getting hit by the ball, various different things. As a pitcher, I mean, as a position player pitching, it's like, man, I couldn't imagine catching or standing behind the plate and catching and then thinking, I'm going to get hurt pitching. You know, what, you know what I'm saying? Right. right. And, and it's, so, it's so different throwing off the mound, too. Um, I mean, I threw a – for my college, Southeastern, uh, right before I went to Winter Bowl, I threw in the alumni game. I threw like an inning. And my arm hurt for a freaking month. Just throwing <laughs> off the mound. I used different muscles and all this stuff. And then – I was telling you earlier that the senior league I play in, we had a blowout game. I was like, let me pitch an inning. And, man, my arm hurt for a month doing that. So, you know, it just to me, it's not worth the risk. A lot of these position players, it used to be maybe a 35-year-old veteran guy who's at the end of his career. Let's throw him in there for an inning in a 15 to nothing game or something like that. But now it's Hanser Alberto for the Dodgers had like 11 or 12 appearances this year. As a utility infielder, I mean, what happens if he blows his elbow out? That's right, exactly. That's crazy to think about. Well, Somebody, I've, well, I've uh, seen the full. I've seen the full evolution of the bringing the guy. I mean, the only time you used to ever see a guy not come out of the pen to pitch was way back in like little league. Mm -hmm. I do remember back in college though. Back, um, I give a prime example. Um, Kobe went to Mississippi State, and they had a guy at Mississippi State back when Clark and Palmero was there. Bobby Thigpen played in the league and he was an outstanding right fielder. He just happened to be a really good relief pitcher. So they yeah. would call to right field. They'd bring him in the ninth inning and they'll make the call to right field to close the game out. So that's Roger that Keith long ago though. I mean you think that's that's crazy to even think about that, especially with the kind of money that's involved in the majors now. So Yeah, there's a guy named uh, Roger Kish Kishnick who uh played a little bit in the big leagues. It was uh a power hitting outfielder would also come in like a closer's role occasionally, um, but not many guys. And and that's what I think what makes what Shohei Otani does is so remarkable that this dude is a number one starter and a four hole hitter or three hole hitter yeah. in the major leagues. It's incredible. Well, that guy's an alien anyway. He's not, he's not human. So. Yeah. He's superhuman. That's for sure. Do you think that, uh, obviously, it's rare to have that much talent to, to be able to pitch as well as he does and hit. But do you think it's also in the past been kind of a, like a, I guess, cardinal sin to have a guy say, hey, he's going to spend time pitching and hitting? Do you think there's been guys in the past that like, OK, this guy coming out of college did both, but he might could have done both professionally and they just didn't because it didn't seem right? Or do you think it was just yeah. a talent thing? No, I, I think you're right. I think there's probably been. Not many guys, but I think there's probably been a few guys in the past that were capable of doing that. But it's, you know, it seems like uh, they let him try and be a position player first, because if you're an everyday position player, I think that you know, and you can provide, uh, you know, you can knock in runs and and provide offense that they feel like that's more valuable than pitching once every five days or out of the bullpen once every twice a week or something. So I think that was. You know, let those guys try and be an everyday guy. And if they can't, we know he's got a great arm. We can always throw him back on the mound. Exactly. Well, the, the thing You're I think about, about earlier. Now, go ahead, Kevin. Go ahead. It's just a statement. But the thing I think about is like Rick and Kill. You know, he kind of lost it on the mound, turned around and swung it pretty well in the big leagues, you know. And it's just yeah. like he have done that the whole time and done both. I mean, I, I obviously that question won't be answered. But, you know, you would have never knew – until he kind of lost it on the mound, you know? Yeah, and he had some sock, man. He had power, you know, and he was uh, – yeah, it's, I never understood that. I've, I've represented a few guys over the years that got the yips, I guess, and uh, I know it's just a mental thing. And I've seen guys in the major leagues. Chuck Knobloch had it. Mackie Sasser had it, where you just psych yourself up and you can't throw. But, 
I mean, fortunately for Rick and Keel, he was able to turn that into being a position player for a while. Exactly. Not to mention that arm he had came in real handy in the outfield. That yeah. guy had an absolute cannon. Yeah. So you you mentioned that you were labeled that you're being that you are labeled now as a what would be a a, a punch and Judy type hitter. Mm-hmm. Is there a place? I mean, will will a will a Judy hitter survive in today's MLB? Well, look who just won the batting title for the Mets. Uh, McNeil he hit nine mm-hmm. home runs this year. Um, hit I think three twenty six. Chokes up. Uses the whole field, hits like third for the Mets who are in you know, in the playoffs. And I think there's definitely a place. And and I guess they think the Judy thing bothers me. It really I could care less about it. It's like, all right, yeah. you didn't play, you didn't play professionally, and I did for 15 years, but you want to criticize me and call me a Judy. So go ahead. You know, I had my little buddy uh, Jacob Jacob Folks, 12 year old kid I uh, met in Atlanta met him and his dad and you know he, he loved it so much he made judy the hitting guru t-shirts and made a logo for me so it's really <laughs> funny well, yeah you know, I, what, I, you know you know what kills me though on that is like if you can if you can set a lineup with seven eight guys that are hitting 280 plus a few 300s just the probability of scoring more runs so t- i mean it, it's just there you know and obviously I, I think baseball, do you think it, it's more from a baseball standpoint of fans coming in? Because the fans, and not even the baseball fans, but just people that go and see a baseball game, I, I kind of think that it is shifting toward that to say, hey, these people have never seen baseball before. What is going to keep them coming back to baseball? They want to see a guy hit a ball really far. Now, the baseball guys want to see good hitters, you know? And I almost wonder if that ain't what it is. Like, the, the person that doesn't follow the game that's just, oh, let's go to this baseball game to find something to do on this Friday night or the Saturday night, and they don't know anything. Just like if I was to go to a hockey game and I want to see somebody fight. Now, the hockey yeah. fan, you know, they might like that, but they probably like seeing other stuff than that, you know? Yeah, and I think that's uh, one of the things that Major League Baseball is doing wrong is they're trying to attract attention from a new audience, and they're, you know, they're losing their – their con the audience they've had forever the baseball lifers the guys who would watch a game just because it was on now don't want to watch a game because it's boring and i watched a little bit of the playoff game yesterday between the indians and the rays i mean one run in 15 innings 11 hits and 39 strikeouts <laughs> who wants to watch that you know and it's not like it was nolan ryan against randy johnson i mean the pitchers were good uh, Glass now was nasty for uh, Tampa, but he threw five innings, and I think McKenzie was pretty really solid for Cleveland, and he threw like seven. But I mean, when you hear that there are thirty nine out of like ninety three batters in the game, thirty nine of them were strikeouts. <laughs> I mean, is that entertaining to anybody? To me, yeah. it's, you're a pitcher, so it probably is entertaining to you. But let me ask you a question, Colby: Who would you rather face? The big power hitting four hole hitter who strikes out forty percent of the time and might run into one, or the the guy at the top of the lineup who hits three twenty, who hardly ever strikes out and, and is going to find a way to put the ball in play. Who would you rather face? I mean, I'm obviously going to face the uh, the forty percent strikeout and the, yeah, you know, and that's what kills me is like I don't understand. I guess baseball goes in waves, maybe so, maybe not, but at some point in time, I feel like they're going to have to get back to the old school, hit it where it's pitched, don't swing and miss, don't, you know, and it's like now the 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 OO swings and the O2 swings are exactly the same, and you're seeing that as a pitcher, and you're like, heck, if I just get it around the zone, I'm probably going to get a swing and a miss, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you throw – hit it. You see guys like, swinging. Yesterday's game I saw, man, so many guys swinging under the ball and under the ball, and then it's a pop-up, and it's a weak – the can of corn to the outfield. It's like, as long as you keep pounding the top of the strike zone, um, these guys are going to swing under it. So why wouldn't you just keep throwing it there? And I don't know what effect, um, you know, get, banning the shift, which I'm totally against, is going to have on the game. But now maybe guys will stay back and try and drive the ball the other way a little bit. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I think it's sad that we, 
hitting is so bad in the major leagues that we have to change the rules to make it easier for guys. To me, that's embarrassing. Exactly. Well, and the thing to add to it, you know, you hear everybody talking about carry, four seam fastballs and stuff, but everybody's swing path is like this. Mm -hmm. It's like, how are you going to hit a flat, uh, plain four seam fastball when you're swinging like this? Like, you might hit that sinker with a little depth on it. Right. So, to me, if I'm a hitter and I know, hey, this guy has a carry fastball, I'm not going to drop the bat head and try to elevate. I'm going to try to get on plane. Like, I really feel like when I watch a big league game and I see, like, Alex Bregman hit, I feel like he's a modern guy in an old school kind of swing. It seems like he's very flat through the zone in comparison to where a lot of guys are. Yeah, he's short and quick, you know. And this other thing you hear a lot now that I make fun of is the barrel depth. You got to get your start, your swing started behind you, so it stays in the. That's just a long swing, and those guys are easy to pitch to. You know, it's the guys like Bregman uh, that has the short, compact swing that uh, you know you feel like this guy can adjust to any pitch and hit it. But a guy who's just looking dead red groove fastball um, that starts his swing early and a long swing, how's that guy going to be able to adjust to off speed? Exactly. They can only hit one of them. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so he runs into one uh, every four or five games. And in the process, he strikes out 12 times. Is that, I mean, is that really helping our team you know, <laughs> score runs? I mean, we can't, one run scored in 15 innings. And I've played a lot of extra inning games in my career and stuff like that. But, it, you know, if we got a guy on, we're trying to get him over. We don't want to wait for a home run. And, and everybody yesterday was, I don't know if y'all saw the game, but, Everybody was trying to end it with a home run. It's okay. tough to watch. Well, all they want today, they they don't mind the strikeouts. All they want to see is the long ball. Yeah. They want to see bombs. That's all they want to see. I I saw you talking about strike, the 39 strikeouts, and I could be misquoting this. I think I saw this correctly, that Aaron Judge, who, who set the AL home run record this year, struck out the same amount of times that Tony Gwynn struck out in the entire decade of the 90s. Yeah, I believe that's right. He did that in one season. He had that yeah. many strikeouts in one season. And, of course, not. I, I don't – Tony Gwynn, one of the greatest hitters that ever lived, that might not be fair to make that comparison. Of course, he didn't hit the long ball either, but he did something that a lot of folks didn't do. He hit the ball where it was, and he made pitchers look really bad at times. Yeah, he did. His job wasn't to hit home runs. His job was to hit – line drives and get on be a table setter kind of guy. And that's what he did. And there's a lot that's of guys true. like that, that, uh, you know, Rod Carew wasn't a home run hitter. Wade Box wasn't a home run hitter. Um, those guys probably could have hit more home runs, but they have to sacrifice their batting average. And that, that wasn't their game. Ichiro, look at Ichiro. That dude was, you know, he'd hit a two hopper to second and be standing at first base. Yep. Especially if you had to chase it for any length of time, like up through the hole. They was, yeah, you, you don't have to worry about wasting a throw. No, nah, and people don't understand the pressure, and I'm sure you do, Colby, the pressure it puts on the defense when you have a, a guy who might bunt, a guy who can really run. As infielders, you got to move in a little bit. Um, and any ball to your left or right, that by much, this guy's got a chance to beat it out. And then if he gets on first, Colby knows what it's like to um, have to hold a guy and um, – yeah, you know, it just puts pressure on the defense. I, I'm interested to know what Colby thinks about, uh, and I guess you've already dealt with it some, the, the limited amount of times you can throw over to a base. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see, wh what level was that that they interpreted that in 21? Was it – might have been might have been low A. Because, you know, they, they tried the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. I remember which, which uh, team I was on at that time when we were doing that, but – to me, it makes it to where – obviously, they're doing it to speed up the game. Um, but if that rule – are they interpreting that into the big leagues over the next – is it next year they're going to – my thought process is on that. What good does a home run do you when they have that rule? Well, if somebody slaps a ball and gets a hit, gets on first base, he's got any kind of baseball IQ and, and is able to get them to pick over and get back safely – well, the third time you got to pick him off. If he's not out and he gets even to first base, you grant him second. So, to me, the contact hitter is going to be more valuable with that rule being mm -hmm. 
you know, coming into effect because – and something just speaking on, like, old school baseball and the way the game's supposed to be played, I can remember – and obviously – fundamentals and all that when I was younger was obviously way worse but like junior college even division one it's not as much of a home run as it is in pro ball like selling out to the home run now there are some that still try to hit home runs but vast majority like at state uh my hitting coach at state I noticed his approach with those guys it wasn't selling out for a home run and it was very tough at bats and air squads because you you felt like you could never put a guy away Mm -hmm. but but I, I noticed in pro ball not as many guys on base, you're not sitting there worrying about, I got to be this this different look to the play, this time to the play. I got to see his lead, this, that, and other. A lot of times they're just standing over there waiting for something to happen at the, at the box. And mm-hmm. just as a pitcher, there's not as much chaos. That's the thing I think about. I remember sometimes in high school, even high school, you know, there would be chaos when somebody got on base because you're like, I got to keep him at first. I can't get him to second because – Anything could happen. You make an error in high school, and that guy scores from second. You know how how bad things can go in high school. But uh, yeah, it's just it's a lot easier to me. And this sounds crazy. I guess not pitch to pitch, but like as a whole to pitch actually. And which I haven't played the big leagues, obviously, but just in minor league baseball than college was, just for the simple fact that they're not trying to swing and miss. You know, they're using an aluminum bat, no swinging and missing. I mean, some do obviously, but they're not to the same extent, and it's just – it's a whole lot easier to me to, to attack a hitter and have that confidence knowing, hey, I can keep him off base as long as I get him out, you know. He's right. not not giving – he's not taking what I give him. He's getting himself out is basically what's happening, you know. Right. And I feel like that's why they sell out to the high percentage strike zone. Hey, oh, oh, throw the ball over the middle of the plate. Like back during the 90s and, and early 2000s back when guys were – pitching not just throwing power stuff well you had to hit that corner to that spot because they were the odds of a swing and miss were so low you know and it's uh and it sounds kind of dumb to hear people say oh he's trying to throw the ball over the middle of the plate but when you look at the swings and he kind of don't have to throw it anywhere else i mean what's the odds he's going to be dead red on that pitch and hit it anyway you know yeah and now you've seen guys saw guys yesterday it's like you know two one, two count, dude throws a dead red fastball down the middle and they take it. It's like these dudes are guessing. <laughs> yeah. They're guessing they're sitting on a pitch, which I don't have a problem with sitting on a pitch, but once you get the two strikes, you got to change your plan, man. You can't keep sitting on that breaking ball because he throws a 95 mile an hour fastball right down the middle. You can't just take it. And yeah. I see guys doing that all the time now. Yeah. You have no chance if you're up there guessing with two strikes and watching pitches. Right, you gotta you gotta shorten up. You gotta, uh, and I always looked fastball, every pitch. That's what I wanted to hit. Why should I look for something else? But I would adjust. And if I got as a right-handed hitter, so if you had me down 0-2, I'm still looking fastball, but I'm looking middle away. And if you throw me a sinker harden in with two strikes and I'm going to try to foul it off or do whatever I can with it. I'm not I'm trying not to take it. Um, but I'm thinking you throw me a fastball middle away with two strikes. I'm going to drive it to right center. That way I could stay back enough to hit off speed pitches. Exactly. Well, I mean, just hearing, you know, your, your obviously your take on hitting and all that, it would seem like to me. Oh, well, that was a quick one. <laughs> It'd be back we in the I didn't turn. I didn't turn him off. He turned himself off. I didn't turn him off. <laughs> he calls, man, I'm these calls up. <laughs> uh, just taking back from like your philosophy and and back when you played, was it easier for you pitch wise to hit a? I would assume it'd be easier for you to hit a four seam than a sinker. That you know, if you had to pick out of the two, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. I hated sinker slider guys, um, but and for guys who threw hard four seamer. Man, I love facing those dudes because I knew I could time it up. That's exactly. why I did well against – Randy Johnson had a straight fastball. Yeah. Roger Clemens was – he would throw it both fast uh, – you know, a four-seamer and two-seamer. Um, but most of the time it was a four-seamer. It didn't move a whole lot, but he had other stuff that, to get you out with. But it's the guys that uh, had those hard sinkers, man, that when you hit it, it's like you're hitting a five-pound weight. And then it's coming in on a righty, and his slider's going away. So you got to cover a lot of area. Um, but I mean, we could hit 
anybody's four seamer, man. It didn't matter how hard they threw. They weren't throwing it by us very often. Oh yeah. And and that's what's crazy to where the game is now. Like from my little take in Pro Bowl, I I, I throw a straight four seam and uh everybody used to say, Oh, it's flat, it's flat, it's flat. Well, now that I've gotten into Pro Bowl and the way they're teaching people to hit to get under it like you was talking about earlier, like you said, you just throw a fastball high. They're not going to catch up to it, and there's a very low percentage chance that they do. It's actually probably an accident if, if you locate a high fastball and they're dead red on it. But those sinker guys, like if you look at the numbers, um, obviously I don't know the exact percentages, but sinkers don't really get swings and misses right now. Yeah. And here in the 90s with uh, with all the guys that were throwing sinkers back then, man, that's they were just dominating if you had a really good sinker, it seemed like. so. Yeah, and it, it is, you could know they were going to throw it, and you just still beat it into the ground. You know, mm-hmm. um, maybe you could get a hard ground ball base hit. Like Kevin Brown, I played with Kevin Brown. You don't, you probably don't remember him, Colby. Um, but I mean, he threw like 95 to 98 mile an hour sinker that and always kept it down. He wasn't trying to throw it down the middle, he was painting it. And everybody hated facing this dude. But he also sometimes lead the league in hits given up because he's pitching the contact. And, you know, some of the infields were, were really fast and those hard ground balls would get through. But still, he'd win 20 games a year, you know, going 240 innings or whatever and just pounding the strike zone with his two-seamer as his slider. Kevin Brown, that dude was – there was moments of dominance. That, that dude was unbelievable at times. Oh, he was. He was tough. All right, so I got a question for you. Okay. With the trend in hitting – well, let's a little bit back up. I got an eight-year-old kid. He wants to play Major League Baseball one day. I, I jump on the internet and I find the hitting guru or I find teacher man hitting or this Jeff Lyle character I run across all the time on, on uh, YouTube. And they're trying to show me how to get my kid to bat 208 and hit 50 homers a year in the majors. <laughs> You're the exact opposite. So why why would they want to listen to you? Because the type of hitting that you're showing them to do is not fun. It's not fun at all. It is when you get three or four hits a game. <laughs> all right. you know? Well, that's, that's that's what I'm saying. I mean, are, is that why you're getting? I mean, I, I joked with you earlier when I talked about the blood feud that you had with some of these guys on the internet. I mean, I've never seen one individual have such an effect on a on a group you know, the hitting gurus of the internet. I mean, you you are a fan favorite amongst most all of them. Yeah, they've all blocked me now. It, it's really funny because um, when I first got into this, you know, I can start tell you how it started. I made I saw a video. I'm on a group text with a couple buddies of mine that are scouts, and we send each other these funny things we see. And so we sent this, somebody sent this to me, and I went in the backyard and had my son video me making fun of it. It was like a 12 second video. And, uh, I posted it and the scout goes, man, you got 400 views on that video. I was like, really? It's like that. What does that mean? I didn't know what that meant. And then he, an hour later he goes, man, you got 4,000 views on that video. I was like, no way. What does that mean? I didn't have any clue. Right. And, uh, so I'm like, all right, I'm getting ready to go to bed. And I look at my direct messages. It's pretty new to Twitter at the time. I really didn't understand much about it. And, uh, all these people were coming after me, man. They're like calling me names, calling my kids' names and stuff. And I was like, who are these idiots? Right. And it's like, what, you know, what did I do? I opened up this can of worms. And what I learned is that these guys uh, want something like this. So once somebody questions them, they all gang up together and just try and pummel this person into submission to they're like, screw this. I'm not dealing with these guys. Cause I found out that, Little Richie's been doing this on different different uh, websites for a long, long time, and he'll get into fights with people and just call them names, do all this stuff, <coughs> till they go away. But they don't know me very well, and all they did was ins- <coughs> excuse me, inspire me to make another video, and that one had like a hundred thousand views, and then it was on, and then these guys are coming after me, and and now I'm just. Uh, you know, one of my buddy, my old clients of mine the other day called me the Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> Grim Reaper of hitting gurus. So if it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that I'm blocked by Little Richie, 
Chaz Angeloni, Joey Cunha, uh, this Sandio character that I uh, oh, yeah. posted the other day. He's now blocked me, and now his account is private. So all these tough guys on the internet, you know, that, that are trying to reinvent hitting have all blocked me now, every single one of them. And uh, yeah, I think it's hilarious. And I, and I get a kick out of it, and people – it seems like people are starting to pay attention. I know there's a lot of people in professional baseball for sure. All the former players support it, um, except the ones who work for Perfect Game and PBR. They can't support it. <laughs> it's gotten into their pocket, but uh, all the scouts support it. They just can't speak out because they work for teams. Right. Um, but there's a lot of support uh, out there, and hopefully uh, parents are paying attention. Well, I kind of wish YouTube would have been around when I was coming up. I would have learned so much about it. My dad just took me out in the backyard with a $12, like, Eastern bat from Walmart or TGNY or somewhere, and he just threw baseballs at me, and I just swung till I kept hitting them. So I – I was doing it all wrong for forever. So now that's the way I would recommend doing it now. And and to all the parents out there that want their eight year old to be a major leaguer, uh, do some research and find out what the odds are. And then uh, once you see the odds of somebody becoming a major leaguer and they're so slim, maybe just go out in the backyard and let your kid be a kid and have fun. And, and if he has it, um, if he has the desire, the work ethic and the ability He'll make it happen. Ask Colby. It's what you got. Is a very select few people that actually have enough ability to play professional baseball, and even a smaller group that have the ability and the mental toughness to play in the major leagues. That let your kids be kids, and it's their life. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, it should be their dream, not yours, mom and dad. Exactly. I, yeah, I like that because the first thing I realized in pro ball was when I'm on the other side of the world, it felt like, which I just north part of the United States that I've never been to, mom and daddy ain't there when I'm struggling. Uh, it's it's 2 in the morning. I'm on a bus ride going all the way back home. Got a game the next day. Can't sleep. My arm's hurting. This is happening. This is, you know, uh, to that kid that had this mom and dad lay everything out for him and do everything for him and push him to do this, He's not going to make it when he gets in that situation. You know, that's what I got to realize real quick is you have to love it. You know, I don't, I don't you know how much you love it, man, and how much you want it because it's not easy. It's not easy. Oh, yeah. I never yeah. considered – let me ask you this, Colby, because people say this all the time. One of the most overused words, I think, um, is grind. Oh, our 12-year-olds are grinders. It's like, come on, man. It's, it's not a grind. I played – four and a half years in the Meyer leagues before I was called up. And I, and although it was tough and I was tired, I loved every second of it. Mm -hmm. I never thought it was like a grind. It was like, I don't have to get a real job. I get to play baseball <laughs> with my buddies and I get paid to do it. How is this hard? This exactly. Is hard. I loved every second of it. Even the bus rides, we play poker and, you know, talk smack to each other. And, you know, yeah. I loved it. Well, the, the only thing with me that I got to thinking about throughout baseball and all that, see, when I was growing up, I didn't leave the state most of the time. A lot of times didn't even leave the south part of Mississippi. Uh, if I did, you know, I'd go to Louisiana here and there. But I didn't I didn't play a bunch of travel ball, go off to, uh, you know, up north or way down in Florida somewhere in place. So I, I wasn't accustomed to being away from home. And then that, that was kind of my only challenge. But once I was playing, I was fine. You know, that's when I got to realizing, okay, I'm gonna have to stay busy, and it was actually kind of a good thing, I think, because you get it missing home, you got to work on baseball. You know, it's a it's a two way street where it helps you, even though you don't, you know. And I know a lot of people probably don't run into that, but that was the only kind of thing that I've I've kind of seen. Well, wait till you make the big leagues, Colby. It's gonna be the greatest day of your life. You know, and and, and the thing that one of the things for me was it wasn't just that I individually made the major leagues it's all my family members and friends that you know are part of this journey that have helped me along the way and what it means to them to have their son or their their cousin or, or whatever be on tv playing professional baseball man it's like they made it and they can tell all their friends it's like yeah that's my cousin on you know on the mlb tonight or whatever it makes them all proud and that was the 
thing that was really cool for me is seeing all my family members just so proud of what I accomplished, like they did it. Exactly. Well, you know, I would think it would kind of get you back to like when you were seven, eight years old, you're sitting there thinking uh, when you're in professional baseball and you're 30, man, I, I must have done something right throughout the way to be able to, you know, and like, I don't know how guys do this, but to be able to stay in the big leagues, like you were saying, you almost had 10 years, man, that's that's unbelievable, you know, because every year there's more talent, there's more guys coming in, there's, and to be able to stay an alpha and stay up there and do well, to, I feel like it has to take unbelievable discipline, even more so than just getting there, you know? Oh, it does. I mean, they say the hardest, you know, the hardest thing at first is to make the major leagues, and then once you get there, it's to stay there because there's always a new group of guys coming up and you're always kind of looking over your shoulder, you know, this young hot prospect first rounder who's in double a killing it and plays your position. You better mm-hmm. freaking not slough off or they're going to get rid of you and bring, bring this guy up. And it, it happened to me a few times where I might've been struggling a little bit. The next thing you know, they call up another guy happened with the Red Sox. They call up this young guy who's got all this power and, Next thing you know, he's playing every day, and I'm on the bench. And then a week later, he's hitting 200, and I'm back in there. You know, and so you just got to be ready when you get your chance, man. And and uh, don't stop, start stop working once you get there. You got to keep working. Oh yeah, that kid would have been okay in today's MLB if he hit 200, <laughs> 208, whatever. Yeah, he would have hit 40 yeah. or so. Well, with well, the major league average this year was 243. Pretty sad, isn't it? Two forty three wouldn't get on the roster with you, would it? The best players in the world can't go one for four. That's amazing. To me. <laughs> yeah, but I keep hearing that it's because the pitching is better than it ever has been, and that's nonsense. Because I know in, when in my era, some of the guys that that I faced that are Hall of Famers, you know, Smoltz, Maddox, Glavin, Randy Johnson, Mariano Rivera. Roger Clemens should be a Hall of Famer. Um, I mean, these dudes were filthy, and they didn't just rear back and throw it as hard as they can and try and get the spin a lot. They were throwing it on the corner. They were mixing it up, pitching backwards, and, and the strike zone was bigger back then too. Oh, yeah. Way That's what I was about to throw in there, man. It's Way bigger. The strike – I mean, <laughs> if we had that – if I had that little thing on, on TV now, I promise you I'd have hit three, over 300 in my career. Oh, yeah. This is this far off the plate were strikes almost all the time. And sometimes you're facing a, you know, a future Hall of Famer like Maddox or Glavin. Or, I mean, it was four, five, six inches off the plate because nobody was telling the umpires after the game that they missed this many pitches. And now these umpires are afraid to miss pitches. Mm-hmm. Well, man, did you, uh, you personally, did you ever have some – this is off topic, I guess. Did you ever face Maddox? Yep, yep, one time. Man, man, what was that? I mean, what did that look like? Like a wiffle ball. <laughs> yeah, I, I went one for two with a walk against Maddox. And uh, um, the funny story about – he didn't walk anybody, by the way. Um, but funny story was I think I was hitting second that day, and I saw him before the game, maybe first, um, but I saw him in his uh, – warm-ups i saw how he gripped the ball and i saw how he put it in his glove and then he would motion for a cutter right which was one of his pitches he's sinker cutter change up curveball not many sliders but i noticed his grip and he put it in his glove when i was hitting off him and i was like he's throwing me a freaking cutter right here and sure enough he throws it over the probably the, in, the middle part of the plate and it breaks toward the outside part of the plate and i just stayed back and hit a line drive to right field that's the only um, that was the only game I ever faced Greg Maddox, but I faced Glavin, Smoltz, Randy Johnson, Mariano Rivera, Roger Clemens, all those dudes. That's insane. <laughs> I'm old, Colby. You know, I don't know that. <laughs> sir, you would have been booed in today's MLB for staying back on that pitch and driving it to the opposite field. Yeah, no doubt. I wish what that a light was. What effort that was. I wish if they would have shifted me, they'd have had three guys on the right side. So then I just. <laughs> I'd have just got out the head out early and rolled over one to shortstop. Yeah. You know, well, the, the thing that's interesting to me about the whole discussion on the differences and, uh, and hitting styles and all, 
when you look at like a Tony Gwynn and the people that look at the Saber metrics and all, and they look at war wins above replacement, his wins above replacement is higher than a majority of the home run guys, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, we, you know, you sell out for something that for whatever reason you sell out to hit home runs. And then it, the, the numbers directly tell you actually the numbers at the, uh, I don't know what you call it. The new school, uh, analytics people talk about actually disproves their way of hitting to say well you don't have to do it only one way you know yeah I, i'm not a fan of that stat that's a made-up stat to me and the, the different teams have different measurements for war they have their own specific war it's like how's it i mean you don't have your own specific uh, stat for average averages hits divided by plate appearances that's it that's that's what a batting average is era is uh, you know, the amount of runs you give up and the amount of innings you pitch. It's not made up. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, that's just the way it is. And war to me is, is when I saw the Joey Gallo two years ago, I think it was maybe one year ago, two years ago, had the same exact war as Freddie Freeman. <laughs> Freddie Freeman hit 300 with like 30 homers and 100 RBIs. And Joey Gallo hit like 190 with 40 homers and 190 strikeouts. It's like how can you say that? He batted 208. That's the, that's the big deal with Joey Gallo. He he's a 208 hitter. Not anymore. You know what his career batting average is now, William? <laughs> I have no idea. 199. Holy well, cow, that's ridiculous. There's but no it's okay way that he, because he hits no. 40 homers a year. That's what they're looking for. Not not anymore. This year he had. Uh, 56 hits the whole season, like 20 homers with 160 strikeouts or 140 yeah. something strikeout. 300, like 320 something at bats and 140 strikeouts. Crazy. Well, what kind of kills me is I hate to name drop Chris Davis, but like he was that kind of hitter. And for a year or so, I think he might have hit around 270, 280 and did, did pretty well. And then I guess he really wanted to sell out to hit a bunch of home runs or maybe just struggled with a uh, bat to ball skill. But then he kind of – he signed a big contract and kind of faded away. And that was a big – what was it one year he had so many consecutive at-bats or so many consecutive games without a hit? Or maybe it, maybe it was a, even a ball in play. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like – Like 160. And I know Chris Davis, a great dude. But, yeah, he really fell off the map, man. It was, it was hard to watch. And it's – when, when guys are getting paid $25 million and they they can't even put them in the lineup because they know they're not on their team, that's got to be that's mm -hmm. got to be tough on your ego a little bit, you know. That, that, listen, or they let or they release you when you have two or three years on your contract because all you're doing is taking up a roster spot. Mm -hmm. that, that, mean, that means you're not doing well. Right? Exactly. Well, and, and the thing that kills me is like when you look at guys that are pretty much on top of the game, you know, they're the top. Yeah, whatever ten hitter in the in the whole league, and then that just shows you how hard the game is. That's what I think about all the time when I think about the big leagues. It's like you might have it today, you might have it two years from now, but if you don't if you don't stay on top of it and figure out what it what it is that makes you good, or you know figure out why you're having the success you're having, then it, it'll go away quick. That's that's what's insane. Some of the best hitters in the world, and that kind of thing happens. You know, I, I guess it's from the pitching side too. You know. Yeah, you can lose it, man, and they'll send you out. They'll send you out as soon as you're not performing, because there's somebody else they're going to bring up yeah. your spot. You know, exactly. Well, Jeff, uh, we are uh, we've run a little short on time tonight. We actually, uh, I heard the word analytics come up. And I, I, it popped in my mind. We'll have to have him back on because he's got two hours worth of just conversation about the analytics. And, you know, the, 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 what is it? The live, the numbers. So before we get out of here though, we do want to know like besides eviscerating certified hitting gurus on the internet, what else you got going on and uh, like where can fans reach out to you? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm um, well, I have been getting a lot of um, opportunities to do uh, keynote speaking. I, I booked three speaking engagements last week. Um, one's going to uh, fly me to Springfield, Massachusetts for two days, and I'll speak up there uh, to the uh, big brothers, big sisters. 
Um, another one is uh, going to be in Lexington, Kentucky. They're going to fly me in to speak to their organization. Another buddy of mine is going to have me and my colonel friend, Colonel Craig Flowers, come up to Prosper High School and speak to those young men. Um, but I've been doing a lot of that. That's why I started all this. I started all this because I wanted to – I saw a guy speak to a high school and thought he was good and thought that I could do this. And so I was like, I have to develop a presence on social media so that people know I even want to do this. And so I did that, and now it's starting to come. Uh, i got a couple baseball camps coming up. I'm doing brand ambassador stuff. and um, I'm just having a ball eviscerating these hitting gurus, man. That's right. Yeah, you like that, huh? I, I was trying to think of the proper word to explain exactly yeah. what you're doing to these poor guys. Eviscerating, yeah. When, when yeah. in one day the guy goes from, I don't know anything about baseball and I suck, to private account, uh, and I'm blocked. I know he's been eviscerated. <laughs> Just glad to see you making a difference. Just glad. Yeah. Yes. And of course, uh, you can be found on Twitter. You're you're yeah. probably trending on Twitter right now as we speak. At O three J Fry, it's capital O. And I don't know why I screwed up and did that instead of a zero, but that's what it is. And then I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. I do some stuff on TikTok, but I kind of feel bad being fifty six years old and on TikTok. I just do that hey. for the rest of the guys. Any, anybody that catches his his video shorts on YouTube, especially if you need a yeah. laugh, it's it's yeah. amazing. I haven't, I haven't had much success with uh, YouTube. I don't really post much on there. Um, my one of my good friends, uh, you go pro um, baseball, has like two hundred thousand people, and that's his full time job on on mm -hmm. on YouTube. He just goes around and makes videos with people, and uh, he's good at it. So, but I, I just can't seem to get the the YouTube going, but that's no big deal. I don't, I mean, I'm not on this for followers. I don't really right. care how many followers I have. I, I asked my it's all about kids. I asked my girlfriend today. I was like, I saw this guy has 150, 900,000 followers on Facebook. I was like, how do you even find out how many followers you have? I don't even know how to do it. We couldn't figure it out. I didn't think that was possible. I didn't think it was that sounds like a made up. That sounds like a bunch of bots to me. Yeah. Well, I know the, uh, uh, Colby, you might know who the Island Boys are, right? I've heard of them, yeah. They're freaking idiots. They have like <laughs> tattoos all over their face and stuff and their hair, and they do stupid songs on, on social media. This one dude has 6.9 million followers on uh, TikTok. So I told the gurus today, I was like, um, all you gurus who claim that, that you know what you're talking about because you have a lot of followers, this idiot has 6.9 million followers, and check him out. <laughs> <laughs> If your kid came home looking like this, William, you'd bust him. <laughs> I promise you. I'm, 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 I'm familiar with the Island Boys. I know who you're talking about. I don't know that I, I don't know a lot about them, but I know who you're talking That's about. That's good. So. You don't need to because they're <laughs> morons. <laughs> I think they're in jail now, so I don't think we have to worry about that. So. Yeah, but I Jim, we, we can't on. thank you enough, brother, for being on today. That's I, I tell you, I've had these have been two of the most interesting conversations I've ever had, especially with a baseball guy. Me and Kobe are baseball guys. You know, he's he's a young guy, but he's an old old soul kind of guy. Um, and we're getting an opportunity to talk to a lot of guys from, from back in the day, and it's bringing back a lot of memories for me for sure. The Kevin Brown reference you made, I hadn't thought about Kevin Brown in forever. And as you're talking, I'm sitting there running. I remember highlights running through my head of this guy pitching. Uh, he's nasty. And Colby, I, uh, it's nice to meet you. And I, I'm going to uh, follow your career, man. And best of luck to you. And like he said, you seem like an old soul. Seem like you have your all your ducks in a row and you know what you want to do, man. So I wish you nothing but the best. Man, thank you. Appreciate you coming on, man. That's, that's bit, anytime we can even talk to a to a big leaguer, that's something. But especially have him on our show, that's, that's unreal. Thank you. Well, I'm just a normal guy, man. Just happen to have a pretty cool job for 15 years you know? <laughs> yeah oh yeah really cool one <laughs> yeah. all right everybody that's gonna wrap it up today for our audio listeners uh, we're gonna go to a couple commercials on the way out and for our uh, youtube uh, folks will be uh next sunday another live show 6 p.m eastern 5 p.m central thanks again jeff and yeah. everybody have a great evening all right we'll see you guys